everyone looks so happy. They're just like, oh God, I can't believe I'm in class again. So it's 9.23, it's about 1.30. So we'll start talking about the basics of math, the essentials of mathematics. So the one of the things, like I said, I have a really bad sense of humor. Can everyone see the PowerPoint? At least somebody nod. Okay, good. So we'll start with a little humor to start. Just because I like to break it. And these are a couple of things I found this morning that made me chuckle. So what's your favorite paradox? If you ask Rick, Rick Astley for his copy of the movie Up, he can't give it give you is he'll never give you up however in doing so he lets you down thus creating the astley paradox and then a physics question you can tell the sex of an ant by dropping it into water if it sinks it's a girl ant if it floats it's a boy ant all right somebody's laughing i appreciate it that's what i need i needed i tried dating an anesthesiologist but the relationship didn't work out the breakup though was painless i accidentally sprayed my body spray in my mouth now i talk with an accent all right, I got some jokes, uh, there we go. And actually the bottom one is from a, a field back in Pennsylvania where I'm from. Entrance to the field is free, but the bull will charge later. Yeah, I live in redneck world. That was kind of amusing to me, so I had to keep it. So let's look at some, today's lesson and whatever we, however far we get through it is gonna be kind of the basics of math. Just reviewing the stuff that you probably had since elementary school, right? So we'll talk about whole numbers. We'll talk about integers, symbols, number statements. Then we'll get to our normal stuff, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Rounding, estimates, statistics. Yeah, that's the one. When we get to statistics, that's when I start seeing people's eyes glaze over. Um, but we'll get through that, I promise. I don't like statistics either. I don't consider statistics math. It's some foreign language. Time in Roman numerals. So that's kind of what we got in the first lecture. That's a lot of stuff, but it's as simple as possible. So whole numbers are positive numbers that are greater than zero, cannot be a fraction, cannot be a decimal or a digitization of fractions. And why do we use whole numbers? Well, we use them all day, but we don't think about it, right? Measuring our body weight, because we all do that every day. Right? Well, I guess if you're losing weight, you measure it every day. The speedometer, well, not so much anymore because we're not going very much, very far anymore. Uh, medical dosage, medicine dosages, caloric intake. If you're into one of those people that watches caloric intake, I'm on a diet as well. I'm on a seafood diet. I see food and I eat it. Prescription and over-the-counter drug labels contain a lot of whole numbers. So that's kind of one of the things we'll use a lot of our math for because we do deal in medications. You wouldn't think that we do, but medications are becoming a bigger and bigger part of our job as PTAs. We have to know what the patient's dose is what they take every time and what their dosage is, the amount of meds they take over that whole course of their condition. So let's say that you have the flu. Now nah, the flu is not a good example. Let's say that you have a bacterial infection and your, your doctor prescribes you an antibiotic. Your dose is how many you're supposed to take at that time. So every four hours, every six hours, whatever it is, one pill every six hours. The dosage is how many pills you're supposed to take over that whole illness. I like to think about this, the biggest area that we have abuse of that is obviously is opioids, right? Opioids used to be, and does anyone know what opioids were supposed to be designed for? Why we have opioids? What were they originally planned for? Does anyone know? You can type it or you can breathe that, I can sign it, no. Cancer, cancer pain. That's why we had opioids to start with. Because if you don't know it, if you've never encountered anyone that has cancer pain, like bone pain or bone cancer, it's excruciating. So opiates were designed to take care of that and also take care of combat wounds. Somebody gets their leg blown off, you wanna kind of sedate them so that they don't bleed out. But now we kind of move them into, you've got a toothache, well, here's 40 oxycodone, right? And we wonder why now we have an epidemic of people that are addicted to opiates. My graduating class, I graduated from a small town in Pennsylvania. We had 97 students that graduated in my class. Or no, I'm sorry, 96 students graduated in my class. I just found out the other day, out of those 96 students, 37 of them have died from opiate overdose. So a full third of my class in Pennsylvania has died from opiate overdose. That just says we're not taking drugs right. right? Molecular makeup, the drug strength. This always killed me when I did triage, because I used to do triage in the ER as well, that somebody coming in seeking pain meds, 
could tell you the strength of every single pain med. They knew what the difference between an Oxy-10 and an Oxy-25 was. And they didn't want those Oxy-10s, they wanted the Oxy-25s because they were stronger. And expiration of day of drugs. So here's a common drug we will deal with, dexamethasone, which is a steroid, right? Steroids help reduce inflammation, reduce pain. So looking at this with whole numbers, the box contains 25 vials, right? So this box contains 25 vials, right? There's the number of vials. It's a single dose vials. Each vial, about one milliliter. And then each milliliter of fluid contains four milligrams of dexameth. Now we might use this for ultrasound. We might use this for e-stim. We'll talk about when these get used in the future here. But if you have four milligrams, that means the medicine has to have other stuff. What well, has a suspension as well. And that suspension is mostly water that the medication is stored in, right? It's sodium sulfate and a little bit of alcohol and water injection of sodium citrate to keep it preserved. But all that's that little vial, right? I always joke, one of the medications I use quite frequently for bone spurs in that is acetic acid. Acetic acid comes in a one milliliter vial, it's about that big, and you get it from drugstores, and that one milliliter vial is $37. Or you can go to Albertsons and buy a whole half gallon of apple cider vinegar, and it's the exact same thing. But they'll charge you $37 for that little vial at the drugstore because it's the same thing. So integers are the whole numbers along with their negative alternates, and they usually are indicated on the number line, right? So plus 13 and minus 13 are both integers. They both exist on our spectrum of numbers. Anything moving the integer up the line is greater than the previous integer. So that four is greater than three. I know this seems silly to mention, but I actually had somebody that didn't understand this once before, right? Zero is greater than negative one. Negative one is greater than negative two. The number line helps us visualize this, right? That's a nice line that extends both directions from, infinity, from here to infinity and beyond. Positive numbers are to the right position and increase further as you go to the right. Negative numbers go to the left and go down the farther you move to the left. So plus 13 is less than plus 14 and plus 15 is greater than plus 14. That's kind of very basic math. I don't think I need to cover that too far in depth, just knowing the difference between what an integer and a whole number is. Whole numbers are single, solitary, positive numbers, whereas integers are both the positive and negative numbers that exist on a number line. Symbology. We use symbology in math a lot. So did the Egyptians, right? They use symbology for everything they wrote. In the mathematics, we use it to show relationships, right? We have our equals to sign. We have our greater than sign. We have our less than sign. We have equal to and less than. We have is equal to and greater than. We also have stuff like the little squiggly line, right? That indicates approximate. So math has a lot of symbols. And then when you get further up into the trigs and the calcs, there's even more symbols you have to know. Good news is this is pretty much the basis of the symbols you need to know for being a physical therapist assistant. And in reality, we don't use too much greater than or less than unless we're talking about pain. And we'll talk about that in a bit. So statements are used to indicate mathematic equivalences, right? They help us make sense of the symbols. They're not necessarily solvable if they don't have an equal sign behind them, right? So that's kind of, they're not a full on formula. They're just kind of a statement that's out there. 33 is greater than 21. That's true. 33 can also be greater than or equal to 21 because of the or. $200 bills are less than $250 bills. If you didn't know that, your bills are in trouble. 100 pennies are equivalent to $1. Well, right now, and maybe not because we can't find any change anywhere, right? Yeah, I don't, I'm not so keen on taking dollar bills at all at this point because you never know if it's got the vid on it. 12 a.m. is equal to midnight. So those were kind of what the statements indicate. The statements just indicate something going on with mathematics, right? I could even indicate your boredom right now on a level of a mathematic statement. It'd say your boredom is equal to 10 out of 10 on the mathematics statement. It'd be very true. That's okay. We'll get through this, I promise. Order of operations. Oh, remember this back from when you started learning math? 
because doing order of operations is very important when you're doing a math problem. You always got to make sure that you do things in the proper order. So whether you learned it as PEDMOS, which is the way I learned it, or I keep getting argued with, with I guess here in Nevada, we do it PEMDOS, I don't know, whatever. The multiplication division are reciprocal of each other, so you can do those in either order you want them. But we start with our parentheses, our exponents, division, multiplication, addition, and then subtraction when we're going through a complex problem. Good news for you. You'll maybe have one or two complex problems for me for this. That's it. And when I say complex, it's really not going to be that complex because we don't really do much in PTA where we have parentheses, exponents, division, multiplication, addition, subtraction, all in one thing. That just doesn't happen. We're mainly concerned with is 25 pounds greater than 30 pounds? No, it's not. So addition is our basic order of operations, right? It involves combining one number with another. It's, you're combining two add-ins. I know that everyone remembers that they were called add-ins. And it leads into the other orders of operation. Your solution in, math, in addition is called the sum. Your sum is always greater than your parts when you're going through things, right? You're, when you look at adding things together and you get multiple things coming into your bank account, your sum should go up. Unless, of course, you have bills going into your bank account, then your sum doesn't go up. And then you're actually doing subtraction, which we're going to talk about in a bit. So I have here like 2 plus 5 equals 7, 7 plus 14 equals 21. When you're doing math, remember that if you column adds up to more than 9, as the example over here to the side, you carry the 1 and you add it to the next column. Good news for you is I'm not going to be that meanie, meanie teacher, teacher, and you are able to use your calculator for this. One thing I will say when you're doing your math problems, always do your math problems twice on your calculator. It takes one extra second to do it twice, right? And it goes back to that old adage, you measure twice, you cut once, right? So take time and actually do your problems twice just to make sure you get a similar answer. Because if you get a different answer, it might be time to go back and look the way you did the problem. I've done that before, right? I've worked with patients and I'm working through their calories and stuff like that. And like, huh, one time I got, they need 2,100 calories. Next time they need 7,100 calories. I think I did something wrong here. Go back and check your work, right? So in physical therapy, adding distance to the patient's walking. Yesterday you walked your patient 75 feet with you. And today the patient walked 25 feet further. So yesterday we had 75 feet, we added 25 feet. Patient walked 100 feet today. That's fantastic, they should only have two. <laughs> right? But that's gonna be important because as you get physical therapy goals, you need to know how much further your patient's progressing. You may have a specific number you need to get them to. Maybe the, the goal is to get them to 150 feet. Well, then you have to know how much further you've gotta to go to get them to that 150 feet because I guarantee the patient wants to know what their goals are. They want to know where they need to get to. And then we've got a nice patient down here. We can talk about fluid to intake. So your patient drank 50 milliliters of coffee. Wow, lightweight. 75 milliliters of water and then 200 milliliters of ETOH. What's ETOH? Does anyone know what that abbreviation stands for? It's a fancy way of saying they got drunk. ETOH is ethyl alcohol. So if you see that on a patient's chart, get worried. If it says patient has ETOH abuse, that's when you go, oh, great. He's going to be withdrawing on me. Fantastic. So if we want to check how much fluid they took. Well, we're going to add all those together. So 50 plus 75 plus 200. And the patient took in 325 milliliters of intake. Why is that important, Mr. McKeever? Well, because when you're working in the hospital setting, you will be helping the nurses measuring patients intake and output. Um, I don't know how many of you guys got into this to measure pee, but you will measure urine at some point in your career. You'll be measuring patients urine output. You'll be measuring patients fecal output. Not very much fun, but we do it, right? We're all part of the healthcare team together. So if a patient has to go to the bathroom, it's not really always the best option to go, hold on a second, let me go get your nurse for you so you can go pee. Nope, we're going to take them to the bathroom. We're going to measure their pee. I can't tell you how many times I've had to empty a person's catheter or something along those lines. And a lot of times those patients are on a fluid restriction. We need to know how much fluid's going in, how much fluid's coming out. 
because we want more fluid coming out because they may be swollen. They may have some problem where they've got pulmonary edema and their lungs are literally filling up with fluid. Your addition can be checked by performing the next operation, which is obviously subtraction. So it's taking numbers away from other numbers. And I'm sure you guys remember this, the subtraction takes the minuend from the subtrahend and leads to the answer of the difference. You don't have to know the minuend versus subtrahend, don't worry. Right? You're subtracting one number from another number. If you're going to do long subtraction, obviously you want to line up the digits based on their position, ones, tens, hundreds. Start from the right, work your way left. If a number cannot be subtracted from a number directly above it, you may need to borrow. And always when you're doing subtraction, you can always check your work by doing it in reverse and going through addition. If you subtract a number from another number and you get one number and you add it back into it and you don't get that original number, you did something wrong. So if I look at this and go, well, I got 67 minus 23 equals 44. If I add 23 back to 44 and don't get 67, I've got a problem. I did something wrong along the way. So big thing I can say again is always check your work. So let's look at your hours of work in a physical therapy world. So you work eight hours a day for four days straight. But you also had a half hour breaks each day. How many hours are you paid for each day? Well, in most physical therapy clinics, you don't get paid for your lunch, sorry to say that. When you're off the clock, you don't get paid. Some clinics, when you don't have a patient, you don't get paid. So if your patient cancels, well, you're clocking out for that hour. Hopefully we can get over that and not do that anymore. But here you work for eight hours. We subtract out that half hour. You're getting paid for about seven and a half hours for that day. If you're paid $20 per hour, you lose about $10 in that unpaid time. That can add up. Right? That's if you're only working a four day week, that's 40 bucks. I don't know about you guys, but I can do some things with 40 bucks. Um, as far as salary wise, when I put down $20 an hour, is that the best salary in the world? Absolutely not. Does it happen? Sure. If you're going to work in pediatrics, you're probably going to make about 20 bucks an hour. Peds doesn't pay. I don't, I didn't get into peds to make money. That's for sure. But you'll make more than I've, I've had students make up to 55 an hour working in now patient with working in clinics. So just depends upon where you work. So back to that patient, they took 325 milliliters of fluid in today. Well, now they vomited 15 milliliters up. They peed out 75 milliliters and had 200 milliliters of watery charged stool, discharged stool. Yay, we had to measure all that. So they pooped out some water, they peed out some water and they threw up some water. Well, now we need to know what's the difference between their intake versus their outtake. What did they retain? So we're going to add all of our outtakes up, come up with 290 milliliters of outtake or output, subtract it from our intake. So the patient retained about 35 milliliters. For a healthy patient, that's okay. But if you have a patient that's on fluid restrictions that might have pulmonary edema, that 35 milliliters of extra fluid goes right to their lungs. And now their lungs have more fluid in them. And you can eventually end up leading to a patient dying. And I'll tell you, patients don't follow the rules very well. I know it's a surprise, right? You tell them they can't drink water and they're not allowed to have water, you'll find them somehow wandering their way into the bathroom to stick their head under the faucet to drink water. So these are important. When we are measuring fluid, or fluid we've got to measure them accurately. Multiplication, nothing more than repeated addition, sometimes a lot of repeated addition. You're factorizing numbers. The two parts you're multiplying together is factors. The answer is the product. Remember when we used to do these things back in the old days, we had these multiplication tables and you're like, one times one is one. One times two is two. One times three is three. We just have to memorize that. Well, now we got a calculator that does it all for us, right? But this was the, the way we learned math for the longest period of time. You know, Back when I started learning math, we learned it on an abacus. I'm joking, I'm not that old. But, you know, we did learn math a little differently nowadays, right? Now I'm going to tell you flat out, I am not going to teach you this new common core math stuff. I almost <laughs> used the term I didn't want to use. Common core is not math, I'm sorry. I teach math, I tutor math. Common core is not math. 
I don't care why two plus two is two or two plus two is four. It just is. I don't care why two times two is four. It just is. We don't have to get into theory in third grade, right? And I'm, I hope that I have some parents in here that kind of agree with me on this, that you, know, you shouldn't have to understand why seven plus one is eight. You should just know that if you have seven donuts and you eat one more, you probably shouldn't have ate eight donuts, right? So I, I will try, math to me is as basic in black and white as it can be. Not until you get into theoretical math and are talking about you know, how math relates to string theory and the parabolic formulas and stuff like that, do you get into kind of abstract math or we talk about the number I and stuff like that. The math we have to deal with here in physical therapy is just gonna be straightforward. It's gonna be one number plus one number, one number times one number, one number divided by another number. It's not gonna be anything complicated. When you're multiplying, you're simply setting up a long addition program problem. So this is kind of the way to do it. Also remember in a long multiplication, the sum's greater than nine, you'll end up carrying it. But looking at physical therapy, therapy clinic bills $95 per session flat rate for a patient. We wish. A session, each day that clinic completes 125 therapy sessions on average. So how much does that clinic gross each day? This will make you cry when you think about this. If that clinic sees 125 patients at $95 a visit, that patient's, that clinic's making about $11,000, $12,000 a day in gross. I do this all the time to figure out how much money I make my clinics when I work because I wanna see how much I'm not making. If you know, Once we get through the math class, we'll talk about billing and teaching how to bill ethically as a clinician. If you bill ethically, you can make your clinics money. Unfortunately, a lot of clinics, specifically in this area and a lot of areas in Arizona and that don't always bill ethically. And it's, it's a challenge, right? They're billing things for patients that they never did. And fraud is never something you guys want to be part of, so don't do it. But, you know, that $11,000, $12,000 seems great, but now as a clinic owner, I'm seeing that a little differently because now I've got to figure my overhead in. How much does it cost for me to keep the building open? How much does it cost for the electricity to keep the building open? How much does it cost to reimburse me for all the equipment I bought? Pay all my salary for all my staff. All of that's got to come out of that daily gross. And hopefully at the end of the month, if I take my daily gross and I take my expenditures and I look at them, I should hopefully make a little bit of money at least enough to pay for the clinic. That'd be really nice, not always. And remember, if you have a question that has a label in it, in this case, there's a dollar sign, your answer has to contain that label. Don't get tricked out. Don't let yourself answer a question and just answer at 11875 when the real answer is $11,875. Don't get cheated on that. Divisions, the inverse or reciprocal of multiplication in the same manner that addition and subtraction are related. You're splitting number into parts. The dividend or the number, or the dividend is the number being divided. The number doing the dividing is the divisor and the answer is the quotient. Again, don't get hung up on memorizing those. Division can be shown horizontally, vertically or with the silly division symbol. I always thought that was a silly division symbol anyway. Right here we have 12 over four equals three, right? And if you look at that, that's nothing more than a fraction. So division in reality is nothing more than fractions. So if you're bad at fractions, don't worry, you can do division. And it's the same thing. 14 divided by two is seven. Dr. Johnson said he can't wait to meet you guys. He's got him, he's getting himself set up, he said. This is our funny division sign here. How you do your math, I don't care. I'm not going to look at your work. I don't care about your work. I care if you get the right answer, right? So if I give you a question that says you know, 81 divided by nine, are you able to get nine? If you're not, then nine, you got the answer wrong. So division and physical therapy, looking at carbohydrates here, because we always want to look at our carbohydrate intake, right? Carbohydrates have four calories per gram. The patient is consuming a bowl of soup with 368 calories of carbohydrates. How many grams of carbohydrates has they consumed? This must be a bowl full of crackers. That's a lot of carbohydrates. 
So here we look, we have 368 calories. We know that each gram is four calories. So 368 divided by four, they ate 92 grams of carbohydrates. Mmm, that's a lot of grams. That's a lot of sugar, let me tell you. What type of patient might we be worried about their carbohydrate intake? What medical condition? Diabetic, exactly, right? It does fuel our brain, but it also fuels diabetes. I have a great name for that eventually, right? And, and the patients that have diabetes, we have good diabetics that just don't manage their, their blood sugar very well. And then we have those that say, oh, my blood sugar has been really good. I only ate four chocolate bars today, but I managed it because I injected seven times. No. Um, Funny story, one of, my, one of my first clinical affiliations I went on, I got to see a total hip replacement on a lady. And I'll, actually, I think I have some video from that when we get to the hip replacements in semester three. But she was 684 pounds. She's fairly large. The reason her hip broke was because of her weight. In order to get to her hip, the doctor literally had to take a melon ball scoop and scoop fat out of the way. And she was diabetic, of course, had other problems along with it. I got to see her surgery. It was an awesome surgery. I go to see her the next day after she comes out of surgery, and she's literally sitting in there with a bucket of KSC in one of the largest Hershey bars I have ever seen. I'm not talking, I'm talking one of the ones you get from the Hershey store downtown that's like six feet wide and five feet long. She's like gnawing on the Hershey bar. Like, what are you doing? They put her on a calorie restriction, but her family brought her in KFC and chocolate, right? Those are the fun times you'll have. So if you work in a physical therapy clinic and they provide you with 80 hours of paid time off for the year, you're paid 24 times over that year, how many hours PTO do you earn each pay? This is very common. Even if you've worked somewhere else, your PTO is gonna accrue based upon your paycheck. I will say that in physical therapy, one of the nice things I've encountered is in physical therapy, in medical field in general, if you are starting employment at a place, most of the time your vacation and your benefits start literally on the first of the month following hiring. So you'll start accruing vacation and, you know, and whatever else you need, usually that first month, the next week. You know, the good news is if you get hired on the 31st, it's the next day. But it's a little different than working in a corporate IT field where I used to work, where you know it could be six to nine months till I see my benefits. The therapy in the medical field has pretty well unlocked knowing that, well, you don't have to work at this place. You can always go down the street and work somewhere else that might offer better benefits. So we better give it to you. And I have a hole in my head. So in this case, you're earning about three and a third hours per paycheck. So if you want to take that 40 hour vacation, you need to know how many paychecks you got to work before you can take that 40 hours, right? Or you could be like me and just have your, you know, their, your PTO be capped and never take any vacation. Either way it works, um, whatever works. But that's an important part, right? It's an important part of your salary is your vacation. So solving for unknown numbers. Right? This is looking at all of those orders of operation we just talked about. One of the things I want to clue you in on here, solving for an unknown number, whether you know it or not, is basic algebra. People freak out about algebra. For some reason, if I put that little line there, you can solve these. But if I come in and go x plus 14 equals 78, solve for x, people freak out. Oh, algebra, it's the same thing whether it's a blank or whether it's a letter there, they're the same thing, right? So how would we solve this? Well, we just have to do what? Do the reverse, right? 78 minus 14, we'll get our number over here. So what's the answer for the first one? What plus 14 equals 78? Anthony keeps popping in and out of my screen. It's really creepy. Yeah, 64, right? What minus three equals one? Well, we just add them back up to the reverse order of operations. Three plus one is four. What times four equals 24? 
Yeah, six, right? These are easy ones, I know. This is the level of the math problems you're gonna get from me. Can we agree that's okay? Yeah, see, that's what I like to hear. And then what divided by three equals nine? What do we have there? Thank God. 27, good. And then how will we make sure these are right? Well, we'll go back and redo the problem, right? I could go back and add, put it in my calculator, 64 plus 14 should get 78. Four minus three, it should, hopefully you don't have to do that in calculator. If you have to do that in the calculator, we got some, we got, we got, we got some explaining to do here, right? This one maybe okay, six times four, you're just not, you don't, you, you're having a bad day and you ran out of fingers, so I understand. Happens to me too, especially where I come from, considering most of the people where I live are missing a finger or two. They're like one, two, I can't count any higher, I'm missing the rest. When your uncle says, hold my beer, that's when you know problems are happening. So rounding helps us reduce numbers and makes them more manageable and can be used to form estimations, which we'll talk about. That squiggly line thing is used in place of the equal sign to indicate, indicate approximate equivalency. I always love that. Approximately equivalent. See, wait, what? It's really approximate equivalence. Mr. McKeever made a spelling mistake there. When rounding different places, we use zeros for placeholders. We need to know what place we're rounding to. Ones, tens, hundreds, thousands tenths, hundredths, thousandths. Be aware when I ask you a rounding problem, make sure you read whether I'm asking you to round to the tens or the tenths when we're talking decimal. Pace, position adjacent to it is less than five, we round down. Greater than five, we round up. So here we have rounding 1,005 to the nearest thousandth. So we look here, we're rounding to the nearest thousand. So that's the number we need to round to. This is our placeholder position. That's less than five. So we round it down. Here we have round to the nearest hundred. That's what we're rounding to. Our number is nine. So we're going to round up. Rounding the nearest hundred is 1200. Rounding five to the nearest 10. Our position is a zero, but that's a five. So we're going to go up. And that equals 10. Why is it important for estimation, right? It helps us estimate and provide quicker answers. I use estimations a lot, and I'm gonna to talk to you guys about that when you're taking tests. Because when I encountered math questions on tests, I never sit there and hand, long figure them out. I do estimations, right? So if I had this on a test where 23, 32 plus 29, 17 equals what? I have two options. I can manually add those together. Or I can do a rough estimate and go, well, 23.32 is about $23, right? 29.17 is about $30. I could even say it's about $29. That's probably the better option. And so 23 plus 30 or 23 plus 29 is either 53 or $52. And I'm going to go down and look at my answers because one of those answers in those ABCs or Ds is going to be close to that. The other three aren't. If those other three aren't, they're wrong. And then I don't have to do any math at all. I can just sit and go through and go, oh, so I've got 24 plus 30. So I've got, you know, 54, go down. Okay, I've got a 52.49, a 76, a 36, and a 41. Well, my 50 is the right one. I don't even have to do any math at that point. Remember if the digits day adjacent is rounding up or rounding down, Determine the midpoint and round up or round down. So talking about money here. If we go 50 to 99 cents, we're gonna round up. For time, 30 minutes to 59 minutes, we're gonna round up. And we're gonna talk about time pretty heavily because we gotta talk about billing. And I gotta teach you how to bill properly so that you don't get in trouble by Medicare. Because the last thing you want is Medicare breathing down your neck. Trust me, I've been in clinics where Medicare comes in for an audit. It's not a fun time. It's a little bit boring and it's a little bit annoying, right? For money, one to 49 cents, we're gonna round down. For minutes, one to 29 minutes, you round down. Now I wish this was really when we're talking about um, clocking in and out and getting our hours that if we got to 31 minutes, they gave us the full hour, right? That doesn't happen. 
they'll give us 31 minutes of pay and say too bad. Um, but we'll talk about how different employers will handle this. A lot of employers, when you're talking about rounding for your time card, they'll say the eight minute mark, which is what we'll talk about for um, Medicare, the eight minute mark is kind of the round up, round down point. Whereas if you work for 38 minutes, they'll give you 45 minutes of pay. If you work for 37 minutes, you'll get 30 minutes of pay. It's kind of the way most healthcare providers work. So here we got Bob. Bob's got some higher level executive order deficiencies in his brain. What that says is Bob bumped his head. He's asking us to make his expenses in physical therapy for the past four months so he can budget for the next four months. So in March, Bob spent about 65.85, April 59.10, May 62.75, June 58.25. If we could add all that together, we had a calculator or handy to do, 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 do our math and tell him that he actually spent 25 or $245.95. Or we can just estimate this and go, oh, it's about 70, that's about 60, that's about 60, and that's about 60. Tell Bob, you got to buy about $250 worth of pay to cover your expenses. 250 is going to cover that 245. Now, is that always going to be what his is? Maybe not. And we've obviously had some days where we've done different treatments with him and his bills have been up. We've also had some days where his bills have been lower. On average, looking at this, he's got about a $63 bill every time he comes in. That's actually pretty good for therapy. Honestly, lately, that's pretty good for therapy. Insurances aren't paying as much as they used to, that's for sure, for patients. All right, told you when we get statistics, everyone's gonna go blank faced at me. That's okay, I'm going to tell you some nice things. This section is what you need to know for math. This section down here, we will go through when we actually get to statistical analysis in semester four. You will have to know statistical analysis. And we'll talk about that in a second. It's a collection, organization, analysis, and interpretation of data, right? And this isn't like Star Trek data, this is actually data. It refers to a collection of methods used to process large amounts of data and report overall trends. Right now, there's all kinds of statistics on Corona, and I'll kind of use that as an example coming up here. We'll look at what our mean is, what our average is, our median, the middle set of numbers, the mode, the most frequent number, and the range. So talking about COVID and coronavirus, right? When this virus started kicking in, the mean or the average age was, let's change my color here, I don't like red, was about 63. So in the first three months of the pandemic, the average was about 63 years of age. So that tells you that a lot of old people got sick. Does anyone know what about the average is now? So I see a 20, uh, 27 was from the other one. So the average right now is about 30. We've dropped 30 years in about six months. So that tells us that virus is becoming a little bit more virulent and it's starting to spread in our population and more people are getting sick from it. The median in that case would be where is our midpoint on our average? If we're looking at good statistics, usually the median and the mean fall about the same place. We have an example coming up. The median at that point when we were looking at you know, the COVID virus, the median was falling somewhere around 60. So we had a bunch of numbers in the low, we had a bunch of numbers in the high, but the median, the middle number was about 60. That's good when we're looking at statistics. They're pretty close to each other. We're good. The most frequently occurring number when we were looking at statistics of COVID at the very beginning was 85. 85 was the most occurring age when people died of COVID. Well, unfortunately, we can't always say that's 100% COVID's fault, right? Because when you get to 85, you probably got lots of other stuff as well, right? We are not designed to live forever. Once you hit 40, if you guys haven't hit 40 yet, most of you haven't, sorry to tell you, that roller coaster starts going down. Once you get to 50, that's in, that incline starts going steeper, gets 60, it's steeper. Then if you get to 70, you're now looking straight down, right? But the most frequent number at that point was about 85. The most frequent number now occurring is about 40. So our age for this virus is getting younger and younger. 
and the range. When we started back at the very beginning in say April-ish, the range was we had people that were as young as 37, as old as 95 that were dying from it. Now, I don't doubt we probably had people older than 95 dying of it, but we didn't report them because they probably said they died of natural causes. Now our range, the youngest we've seen so far infected was a six month old in Florida. So a six month old getting infected with COVID and the oldest we've had is probably still in the eighties. I use these for your tests because I look at them and I look at where my mean of my test is. I want it somewhere in the eighties. So if my test, if the mean or the average of my test scores is in the nineties, Either A, you guys are a really awesome class, which is possible, I've had that happen before, or B, I went too easy on the questions, which has happened before as well, right? But this, I use this very frequently to determine how you guys are learning what I'm talking about. If you're paying attention to me, if I'm boring you, what's going on? These higher level of statistics, woo wee, I hate these. These tell us when we're looking and formulating plans, how likely is this research we're looking at to tell us what we want it to tell us? So I got that slide coming up here. So here's how to figure out each of those means and medians. I'm not gonna go through each of those because I just kind of talked about them. I wanted to get to the statistics here. Know the definitions, so look through them, but you're not gonna have to calculate p-value, standard deviation, sample size. Good news is even when you get to fourth semester, you're not gonna have to calculate sample size, confidence intervals, stuff like that. If you wanna get into research later on, which you can as a PTA get into research. Uh, we have a couple of PTAs that are working with UNLV right now on some research on prosthetics. Sure, you can do that. I'm not a big statistical person, I don't like it. I'd rather treat patients. If I want to do statistics, I'd go get my PhD. Don't want that, right? But these are important in physical therapy because they help us play a part in ethical and evidence-based practice. When I started in physical therapy, we did the same exercises for pretty much everyone. You came in for total knee replacement, you got some exercises. You came in with a knee strain, you got the same exercises. Came in with hip strain, same exercises. We learned that that's not the best way to treat patients. And so now we know, looking at the research, what's the best treatment for a patient that's got a total knee replacement that's 65 or older, we can even specify. What's the best treatment plan for somebody that's 35 that has total knee replacement? We have research on that. And being a good clinician involves being able to look at research and look at what research is bunk, meaning not that great research, and what research is really good. These, not, these words will come back to haunt you on your boards, but not in a method where you have to calculate them, just understanding what a high p-value means and what a high alpha value means. But again, that's fourth semester stuff total. But for example, I'm gonna use blood flow restriction as a really good example. Has any of you heard of blood flow restriction in physical therapy? Have any of you seen that done in therapy? I don't see anyone saying yes. All right, we got you one yes from Amanda, fantastic. Blood flow restriction involves cutting off the blood flow to a limb in order to help it get hypertrophy or get stronger. Yeah, it's used a lot in bodybuilding and that makes sense in bodybuilding. Well, I, I can compare that, compare and contrast that to physical therapy. If you go out right now and you look for research on blood flow restriction, the only thing you will find out there is positive research on it, that it works for everything. Whether you're 65, 95, 45, 35, 20, blood flow restriction is the best thing in the world to do with patients. But if you go look at any other treatment in physical therapy, you're gonna find reasons why it's good for this population and reasons why it's not good for this population. There's barely any negative research out there that shows why maybe blood flow restriction is not good for somebody that's 75 or older. And I can think of logical reasons or on blood thinners, they've got poor circulation. There's all kinds of reasons I could say that it doesn't work. But if you ask people that do research on BFR, they say, well, we just didn't include the bad information. Well, that's bad research. If you don't include the negative information, it's bad research, right? That was a big thing during COVID when we started talking about hydroxychloroquine. 
I'm sure all of you heard that whole debacle that was going with that. Well, the person, the, the doctor that was pushing hydroxychloroquine was pushing only one study. And that one study showed that in five people out of 100, it helped those people get better from, from COVID. That sounds great. But then there was a study over here that showed that if you gave people hydroxychloroquine and they had an active infection, they were likely to develop a fatal heart arrhythmia and die from heart failure, right? But this was a game of look at this survey over here, don't look at this survey over here, right? That's where you have to be a good clinician and be able to read all of that information and go, maybe this isn't the best option for my patients. The good news is you, don't, you guys don't have to prescribe medications, so you're not going to have to look in and figure that out. But when you hear stuff like that on the news, that's where you guys got to be better. Now that you're becoming in the healthcare field, you've got to be able to go and look at the research and go, hey, is this stuff really good for it? Is hydroxychloroquine good for certain diseases? Absolutely. It's fantastic for lupus, even though it can stop their heart. It's fantastic for um, malaria, even though it can stop your heart. You're noticing that there's a trend here, right? It stops your heart pretty much for every disease. But you know, when you're going to die of malaria or potentially maybe get some heart side effects, I think I'd rather potentially get some heart side effects than die of malaria because malaria is not a fun disease and I don't want to die from it, right? So you guys, by the time hopefully that we're through fourth semester, you guys will be good consumers of research that you don't have to rely necessarily on any mainstream media, whether it's a left-leaning bias, central bias, or right bias, that you can go and determine your own by looking at the research and going, oh, this is what the CDC is saying about this medication, right? And does this help? There's all kinds of stuff right now out there about trigger point and uh, dupatumus contraction. If you look at the research, the medication's not good, but they're pushing on the ads because it sells stuff. All right, so I'm gonna stop the lecture here. Let me stop recording.